be here. I feel right at home. And uh, it's good to be in church. And uh, I told my wife, I said, well, it's our midweek service. Uh, it's, ours is, of course, Wednesday. A lot of churches are. And I don't, I don't really trust churches that have midweek services on Tuesday. I think there's something wrong. <laughs> and, uh, but I said, so this, this kind of counts for you. And uh, we'll see. Uh, but it is a delight to be here. And uh, as uh, approaching the, uh, the and later years of Brother uh, Wallet's ministry, and of course he's still serving the Lord, and I appreciate him and his ministry, but it be becoming obvious and apparent uh, that he was getting ready to transition, and some from what I heard from him at different conferences, and, and knowing Brother Howell, and uh, seeing that uh, that transition was going to take place, I uh, was excited for the church, and know the job that uh, Brother Howell uh, is doing leading, and uh, he's, he's uh, pulling other men and using them as well, and uh, they're, they're helping him, and uh, the results are obvious. It's good to be here, and a smooth transition. Uh, praise the Lord. That's uh, very much like how it happened uh, at Lewis Avenue. My dad pastored there for 37 years uh, to the day. Uh, I became pastor, uh, and uh, the Lord has blessed there. And some folks ask me, did Dad start the church? But uh, the church was started in 1927. And uh, so, no, he did not start the church, but uh, it's been around for a while. And uh, praise the Lord, uh, it is my privilege to pastor there. And uh, I look forward, I've been looking forward to being with you. And uh, we have tried to get together numerous times, and it uh, just didn't work out. And uh, finally, uh, able to enjoy uh, dinner with Pastor Howell and his family tonight. And uh, enjoyed that tremendously, and uh, just uh, a good time. And Leviticus chapter 10, if you would turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Now, that's always an ominous thought if you come to church and the preacher says, turn to the book of Leviticus, right? And uh, uh, failed, I saw this years ago, failed marketing slogans. It was, uh, I think, a far side. And uh, you, you're all familiar with the I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream, right? And uh, that's great. And uh, they had an ice cream truck, but it was different. It had vegetables. And uh, it, on the side of the, the, the caption was, failed marketing ploys. I cuss, you cuss, we all cuss for asparagus. And uh, so we don't really cuss. I'm just relaying that to you. But if you uh, know the Bible well, we could adapt that to Leviticus, okay? And I cuss, you cuss, Levi we, we all cuss because we're in Leviticus. And uh, it's great stuff. Don't misunderstand. I love the book. But it's a, it's a handbook. You probably didn't read many handbooks for, you know, enjoyment recently. And that's what Leviticus is. Now, all Scripture is given for ins by inspiration is profitable, right? So we understand that. But uh, uh, we're, we are coming here with a specific purpose tonight to this passage. This may be really the only story uh, in the book of Leviticus. And it's one that uh, even though I think if I mention the main idea of the story, there are many who would be familiar with it. There's a detail, an aspect that it took me a while uh, before I, I just came across it one day. I'm reading that and I'm thinking... Well, good grief, how did I miss that detail for this long? And uh, I don't know, maybe you'll be way ahead of me on this, but I think it'll be a good uh, a help to us tonight. I trust the Lord will use it. Uh, I have been uh, preaching uh, this year uh, on the subject of grace. And not just, uh, and not really even at all, uh, much on the fact that we, uh, that God has been gracious to us. Certainly that is a theme worth preaching. I've preached many times, but that really hasn't been the theme of my preaching this year as much as it is for us to show that same grace to other people and uh, great grace. At the beginning of the year when I prepared the, uh, the theme, great grace, I didn't know that it is exactly what we would all need about mid-March, right? Great grace and uh, what we were going through. And so we'll see a bit of that here from this message of, of how God intends for us to treat people. And I think it'll be a challenge. Let's pray. Father, would you please use this message? Would you help me to make your word clear? We thank you for it. How wonderful it is. Even though I tease about the book of Leviticus, you gave it to us, Father, because you wanted to help us. And we're thankful that you did. May I preach it faithfully tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, it, I better make sure I uh, don't forget to mention uh, my wife is here with me tonight. And uh, my wife, Angie. Uh, and th it'll be this Thursday and uh, 27 years uh, we've been married. How about that? And uh, to each other. That's great. And uh, 
Wonderful. And uh, so you see the, uh, uh, the theme uh, of our year there. Great grace was upon them all. And uh, so that's just kind of our theme background. If you uh, flip to the next one there, and uh, really, uh, it, this is the, the title of the message tonight. When grace gives space. Well, why? What does that mean? Well, you're going to see here, and uh, sometimes uh, people can be very insensitive. And we have uh, one of the epic times in the Bible, whether you knew it or not, where somebody was really rough with somebody else. It may not appear so right away, but you'll see. So do you have your Bibles there in Leviticus chapter 10? And uh, we'll get there in just a moment. But uh, speaking of being uh, insensitive, uh, years ago at Texas uh, Instruments, they had a goodbye luncheon and uh, for a longtime co-worker. Now, she was leaving the company due to downsizing. They were letting a lot of workers go. And uh, they, uh, the manager cheerfully commented, man, this is fun. We should do this more often. <laughs> and everybody at that goodbye party got very quiet. And they all kind of looked at each other. And he didn't even, it didn't even dawn on him the impact of what he said, right? Yeah, we should do this more often. Yeah, we're doing it because this, you're firing someone. And uh, yes, it wasn't for, because of incompetence, but this is not a happy occasion. And uh, we're sad here. You know, people can be insensitive from time to time. And people can be insensitive and not have any idea. And, and uh, I hope uh, we, that this isn't the case, but probably the likelihood is when I mention something like that, somebody's insensitive, I hope you all didn't have the same person in mind, right? And the church, right? That one person. So people can be insensitive. Oh, yeah, that's so-and-so, right? And uh, hopefully they didn't say you, but we've all been there. I hope they don't say that about me, but I know there have been times I've given people uh, opportunity. Uh, the, can I tell you the absolute worst time ever? I mean, this is, this is horrible. I was just a kid, though, so that's okay. And, uh, and this is just, it is, it is the worst time. When uh, we had uh, one of our teachers, her brother came to live with her for the summer. And again, I'm maybe fifth grade. And uh, I, I, I think I was even younger. And it's so bad. I hope I was younger. But in any case, this is, and, and I make light of, the, of a bit of the situation, but really it was a tragic situation. Early in the summer, just a mile down from our church, uh, a main intersection, one of the, one of the worst uh, intersections in all of Ohio, uh, we're about 100 yards into Michigan, okay? And uh, we're a stone's throw into Michigan. How do you know? I've done it many times, throwing those stones. But uh, I do live in Michigan, okay? And uh, so uh, in case you're wondering where I'm at. But uh, just a mile down the road, a tragic situation. Uh, she was with her brother, uh, and they turned a corner, and they did not see a cement truck coming towards them. And he was killed instantly. And a very sad situation. It's not surprising that a child did not grasp the whole gravity. Certainly I knew what had happened. And, uh, but at the funeral, I was one of the last ones to leave. I'm the pastor's kid. My dad is with me. And his sister, uh, who's one of our teachers, is walking to her car. And I'm, my path is crossing. And I said to her, don't get hit by a cement truck. I know. Some of you are like, I can't even laugh right now. That is so awful. I was a kid, right? And honestly, you know where it came? I, that's not coming from, uh, I'm going to be a smart aleck. I honestly, knowing my heart, I was honestly trying to think of something to say that, that, that might let her know I knew what was going on. Oh, it did all right. She looked at me. She went white. My dad grabbed me and yanked me. And I'm looking at him like, what? And then, of course, even though I'm a kid, it's dawning on me what I said. I'm like, oh, that is... Now I say it as an adult. I I'm, I'm almost can't be forgiven even as an adult. I get that. If it's a child, we, we can almost understand it. And you know what? As much as I'm sure that hurt her, I'm sure she could go away and say, you know what? He's just dumb. <laughs> He's just a, a stupid. He had no idea the gravity of what he was saying. And I didn't. We come to a situation here in, in this book, in Leviticus, that's almost as bad. And I, I want to let you see what Aaron's going through. And I want, you to let, I want to let you see what Moses is going through. Aaron and Moses are brothers. And, and I hope I can, I can help us as a church be a little more gracious with people. 
And let's look at it here, verse 16. We're going to go back and look at the earlier verses, but I want to start in verse 16, okay? Moses, he's pretty upset. And, he, and he's very insensitive to Aaron, his brother, and we don't understand how insensitive yet. Verse 16. And Mo, Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering. He's looking for the goat. And behold, it was burnt, and he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar. Now, I, let me just say this. No man should have burnt food. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I'm teasing, folks. Be gracious with me. I'm giving you an opportunity to be gracious. They're looking for the, the goat for the burnt offering. They can't find it. And he is upset with two of Aaron's sons. Have, have, you, have you seen a leader? And I've said this at least three times in the last week and a half with my staff. I despise angry leadership. Now, I'll say this. There's a time for a leader to be upset. There's a time for a leader to throw a fit. But I don't ever want to be the kind of leader who leads from a position, a, a constant um, attitude or demeanor of anger. I don't think that's something that pleases the Lord. Uh, there's a time to call somebody out, and I, you better be very gracious when you, even when you do that. But here we have, and by the way, what does the Bible say about Moses? It says he's the meekest man that ever lived. But he can't find the goat for a burnt offering and he's angry. To us, that, that seems so far, we don't know the whole story yet, it seems a, uh, maybe a bit trite. Let's keep looking. Uh, now, now, I want you to notice a phrase here in the verse. With Eleazar and Ithamar, it doesn't just say the sons of Aaron. What does it say? The sons of Aaron, which were left alive. Well, I would think that's kind of an important note. Saying, here's what he says to them, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is mo the most holy, and God hath given it, to you, given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord? Behold, the blood of it was not brought. I'm trying to show some of the emotion that it seems Moses is using. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. He should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. Now, Aaron speaks up. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And this is really the key of the whole passage. And such things have befallen me. He didn't even say what those things are. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? Now, I can appreciate this side of Moses too. And when Moses heard that, he was content. You see, what I'm trying to tell you tonight is there is a reason Moses was this upset, even though to us it seems a bit unreasonable. And I'm amazed at how Aaron handled this. And we don't even understand what he was going through. We don't understand what Moses was dealing with yet. And so it's easy for us sitting here in a beautiful auditorium on a Tuesday night, to hear something or read something about Moses and think, I don't think that was, I don't think that's a good situation. But you don't know what he is dealing with. And Aaron says, such things have befallen me. He doesn't even say what it is. And I think if we understood this, we would think, man, Aaron, Moses' brother, he, he ought to be given a little grace here. To get, he, he ought to be given some space, which is what the message is. When grace gives space. So I'm going to make a couple of statements of truth here that are threaded throughout the whole passage. And I'm going to repeat these at the end, and I think we'll understand them better. The first statement I want to make is sometimes we are insensitive because we don't know what someone else has been through. And, and probably all of us have been there. And it's impossible for us to know what everybody else has been through. Brother Hiles, years ago, had a radio broadcast. And he would say in his radio broadcast at the end, be kind to everyone or good to everyone. I'm not sure exactly the word. Be kind to everyone because everyone's having a tough time. Brother Howell, you can appreciate this. My brother Tom, and uh, he always cuts up. And uh, brother, my brother Tom adjusted that saying. He said, be tough on everybody because everybody's having a good time. And I'm like, okay, I think that changes the meaning a little bit, but... Uh, that's true to my brother, and uh, he's, he's one of my heroes. 
uh, there in the church with me there. I appreciate his ministry. But because we don't know what everybody's going through, we ought to be good and kind to everybody. Sometimes when we're not, I've been there, where I've been insensitive to someone, I have no idea what they're going through. And the second statement I'll make, sometimes we're insensitive because others don't know what we've gone through. In other words, one is our ignorance. I don't know what you're going through. The other is I'm upset because you don't know what I've gone through. And, and it's, it's the opposite. We're going to see that threaded throughout. I'm not going to prove that premise here in the meantime, but I'm going to repeat it at the end, and I think it'll make a little more sense. So here's what I want to do. I want to read through this chapter and get a little context for Moses and Aaron's interaction, these two brothers. So when we understand where Moses is coming from, and we understand when Aaron said such things as befallen me, what he was talking about, how bad it is. And uh, brother, how I am looking for a clock around here. I don't blame you for not having one. Okay, and uh, because I want to make sure that I uh, stick to the time that he told me. I'm a good obeyer, and uh, so uh, I was looking around for that. But that's okay. Don't you pay attention to that. We didn't come to get out. Bless God. Okay, and uh, look at verse one. And Nadab and Abihu. Who are they? The next phrase says, "Who are they? Sons of Aaron." I thought, we, I thought I read about the sons of Aaron. Those were two different sons. Okay. Look at this. Took either of them his censer. That's where they would put the fire. And put fire therein. And put incense thereon. And offered strange fire before the Lord. Now this doesn't, it's not strange because of the color of it. Or strange because of the consistency of it. It's strange because this fire was not taken from the place where God said this is how it's done. Which is why he gave them a handbook. So they would understand that. They didn't listen to God, and look what happens. Uh, they, they had their own fire, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Whose sons? Aaron's sons. Man, that's, that's pretty heavy right there. But what that lets us know is in, when Aaron says, such things has befallen me, he's not talking about he's got a hangnail, right? This is, this is pretty heavy. And verse 3 gives us some insight into God's thoughts. God gives us this insight. It says in verse 3, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh thee, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Aaron didn't say anything. May I summarize what Moses said to his brother? This is what God meant. This is why God said it. Or if I could say, I told you. Man, that's... The man's, the man's sons just got killed. Supernaturally by God. And he's saying, this is what God meant. I, I think, and because I, I, I tend to feel this way myself, I think we could build the case here against Moses. We should not. When I say, like I said at the beginning, there are times we are insensitive to others because we don't know what they're going through. You don't understand the responsibility that Moses is feeling. Okay. I have a hard time, by the way, with verse 2. The fire came down from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. I have a hard time with that because I don't view sin as seriously as God does. I want to, but we don't naturally. We spend our lifetime justifying our sin. And I'm not saying we don't ever get that right. I'm saying that is the habit that we, that we deal with. If you want to know how big a sin is, here's how you can classify it. A big sin is one that somebody else commits. <laughs> a little sin is the sin that we commit. Right? And by the way, what do we do? We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Well, I meant to do this, or this is why I struggled, or this is why I was... Wait a second. You know what you're going through, but so many other people don't know what you're going through. I, I'm, I'm not saying that sin is okay. First of all, get your sin right. But secondly, realize there may be other circumstances that are, that are making it easier for somebody else to stumble, and certainly it should be addressed. But I'm trying to help us be a little more gracious here tonight. I wish, I wish I respected the holiness of God like I ought to and I want to. Frankly, I'm amazed that Aaron kept quiet. Yet I get it. 
Would, it, would we be surprised if we read this and Moses said, this is what God said. And Aaron said, you don't think I know that? Your nephews, my sons just got killed. You don't think I... We wouldn't blame him, would we? His sons just died. Listen, I've seen some people with pretty raw emotions right when something happens. I was in high school. Uh, actually, uh, I was with some high schoolers. We, we had a softball team early in ministry and we were playing another church. And a man was pitching and he pitched it in and one of our best hitters... He had, it wasn't even a good bat. It was more like a metal pipe. And, uh, but that ball would jump off. He smacked that ball. It came back and hit the pitcher squarely on his knee. It's a church softball league. That man, he, he set off to swearing. And, uh, I mean, it's the kind of thing that hair was blown back when you're listening to it. And there's a couple of teenagers. And the reason I mentioned teenagers is because a couple of our teenagers looked at each other and one just kind of went, you know what? None of the men there looked at each other and did that. You know what every one of us thought? Man, I'm not into the habit of swearing, but I don't know what would have come out of my mouth if that softball would have hit me on my knee like that softball hit that guy. I mean, it was bad. And, and by the way, that guy hadn't been saved very long, right? By the way, some of you have been saved a long time, but you work around folks that are uh, cavalier with their language and it becomes easy. Well, you get mad. You may not swear, but it comes to your mind, Right? You, you've got somebody here who, it's, it's raw, it happened right away, and he let out. We wouldn't be surprised if Aaron did that, but Aaron didn't do that. He didn't just feel grief. He no doubt felt embarrassed and ashamed. Parents, those of you that have older kids, we've been there. Where your kids do something, and it may be minor. It might be major. But we know what it's like as parents to think, oh, man, and, and we feel some embarrassment. And, and, and you shouldn't have to feel that. It's not, it's, it don't, I'm not saying, and, uh, yeah, your kids ought to obey, so you should never go through that. No, I, I get it. But no doubt he felt this. Okay, let's look. Verse 4 through 7 is pretty tough. And Moses called Mishael. And Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uh, uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. Whoa. Hey, come get your cousins. Carry them out. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, and as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, Aaron and his two sons, This is tough. Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. Basically, what he's saying is don't grieve over this right now. Those two things is what you would do with grief. Don't, don't grieve right now. Just do what you're told. And lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, beware the, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. That's amazing. He's telling them, listen, the anointing oil is on you. You are going to follow my words exactly. And if you're here tonight and you're thinking, I can't believe Moses would be this tough on them. Hold on. What happened? Aaron's sons died, but Moses nephews died and not the family connection I'm talking about. The fact that who answers for this nation? Yes, God does, but the one leading this nation is Moses. If you think Aaron would be embarrassed about his sons, how do you think Moses would feel about the care of the nation when two of the priests are killed on his watch as a leader? You know what he's doing? He's trying to make sure this doesn't happen again. We might be upset with Moses, and I can understand that, but would you be upset with a parent who sees their child getting ready to run in the road and doesn't kindly say, excuse me, son, I think you might be heading in a direction that would not be best for your future. No, if they said, stop right there, you wouldn't blame them. My kids would ride with me on the church bus and I would drive the bus and I'd drop the kids off at the, the bus kids at home. And, and my own children were with me on the bus and on Sunday afternoons, I would park in front of my house because it was halfway between the bus route and church. And so at Sunday night, I would just drive the church bus back in. It saved me a trip. The kids that would get picked up, the workers, their parents would meet them there at our house. And it worked out well for them where I was located. Well, on Sunday afternoon, I'd have to, I'd, I'd drive down one side of the parkway and come back. And why don't we 
drive on a parkway and park on a driveway. It makes no sense. Anyway, I would have to drive down one side of the parkway. There was a divider, but I would stop, let the girls off. They would go in front of the bus. I'd make sure I'm looking. I wouldn't let them off the bus so I could see it was clear behind me in my mirror. They'd cross in front of the bus, cross the median. It's not a major street. I mean, it's not, they're not having to hop over anything, just grass. And uh, then they would cross over to the house. They, this was the habit they would do every Sunday. And, they, and then I'd go down and park the bus. That just gave them a chance to get in the house a little bit sooner. It didn't save them that much time. We had a youth activity. It was downtown, coming from the same direction, often that we would return. But I came down from the end of the street, and my house was on the other side. Normally, I'm driving this way. My house is over there. I'm driving this way. All they have to do is get out and walk right up to the door. They don't have to cross the street. My daughter, Carly, I'm thinking she was probably maybe third or fourth grade. She fell asleep. We went and saw the Toledo Mud Hens play. And she fell asleep. So we are coming home, and I didn't realize she was, I was driving the bus. And I'm pulling up. I assume she's going to see that's the house. She's going to run right up to the house. Everything's going to be fine. But in her mind, it was dark. She's thinking, I'm going to cross in front of the bus. I'm not watching for traffic because there is no traffic to worry about. She gets off the bus, runs right to the door. There's no, nothing between us. She got off the bus. She went around the front of the bus, and it dawned on me what was happening, and there was a car coming down the side of the bus. I'm, dri I'm in the driver's seat. She's getting off here. She's coming around. I'm seeing that car, and that car is flying. As soon as I realized it, I said, Carly! She stopped, and she looked at me, and she immediately started crying as that car zoomed past. I would much rather her cry than get hit by that car, because if that car hit her, it's over. There is no recovery from that. In fact, I've told that story a few times. I don't even like telling that story because it, it makes me emotional just thinking about it, because of my love for Carly. Wait a second. We understand that as a parent, but we have a hard time seeing how Moses could be that insensitive. Wait, Moses doesn't want anybody else dying. See, what I said is, sometimes we don't know what somebody else has been through. And as we read this story, we don't know what Moses is dealing with. Yes, we don't know what Aaron's dealing with. We didn't know that Aaron's sons had died. But we don't understand the standpoint of ministry where Moses is all business. Why is he all business? Because God's killing people today. And I'm not going to let anybody else step outside of what God wants to do because I care about them, because I'm warning them. And sometimes if you have a leader who maybe pushes it a little too far or gets a little bit wound up or maybe a boss at work or maybe a friend who's too rude with you and you want to say, I can't, but we get so offended so easily. You know what? You might need to take a step back and you might need to realize, I don't know what's happened. I didn't know that their son came home last night and said, I'm leaving. I didn't know that maybe their, their mom told them yesterday, you know what, I found out I have breast cancer and they're not giving me long to live. You don't know that that friend of yours just didn't get bad news. From, you understand? We don't know all those things that are going on and sometimes we just need to take a step back and give some people a, some space to have grace. Now the Bible condemns, make no friendship with an angry man. So somebody who that's, that's the way they, they are, their demeanor, they current, then yeah, you ought to give them space, all right, stay away from them. But there's a time to step back and say, you know what, somebody, and they, they need a minute. Maybe you confront them, but maybe you just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them sleep on this. I'm going to come back and talk to them another time. It's pretty tough. I don't blame Moses for warning Aaron. Eliezer and Ithamar because he didn't want them to die. I also wouldn't blame Aaron if he wanted to die. Parents, how would you feel if your sons were just supernaturally killed? I know there would be part of me that would say, you know what, Lord? Just take me too. Now, again, I'm not saying we should give up on life. I'm saying I think every one of us can understand that a bit of saying, I got nothing left. I got no fight. My sons had died because they did something wrong. Just kill me too. Now Aaron didn't. 
See, Moses is still in prophet mode. First, God speaks in verse 8, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Now Moses picks it back up, and Moses spake unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons that were left. Take the meat offering that remaineth of the offering of the Lord made by fire and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. And ye shall eat in the holy place because it is thy due and thy son's due of the sacrifices of the Lord made by fire. For so I am commanded. And the wave breast and heave shoulder shall ye eat in a clean place, thou and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, for they be thy due and thy sons due, which are given thee out of the sacrifices of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The heave shoulder and the wave breast shall they bring with the offerings made by fire of the fat to wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thine and thy sons with thee by a statute forever as the Lord commanded. And if you're thinking, man, I had a hard time following that. You think you're sidetracked? I bet Aaron was hanging on every word. Aaron's probably thinking that, that Moses sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Why? My son's just died. In fact, I don't even know if his wife knew yet. How'd you like that responsibility, guys? That's pretty heavy. But God decided at that time to say something and have Moses say something. So no wonder when we come to those verses we started with tonight and Moses finds that the offering isn't ready, the goat is not ready for the burnt offering. He's pretty upset. Whew. When he, it was burnt, he was angry. Moses is all business here. And so he says what we read earlier, Wherefore have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it's most holy? And God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. He should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. And Aaron finally speaks up on his behalf, on his son's behalf. And I can't believe the respect that he uses. This is his brother. When my brother Tom, who's eight years older than me, came back to teach at our school, I was still a sophomore in high school. I, I would not call him Mr. Hobbins. In fact, I had guys younger than me, a year younger than me, calling him Tom. And they said, I just can't remember to say Mr. Hobbins. And I remember looking at them like, you're such a moron. You can't remember? That's my brother. And you act like you got a hard time. You're in, yeah, I think at the time they were in 10th grade. I think I was in 11th grade by then. Yeah, you got it really rough, right? You can't remember to call him Mr. Hobbins. But I, I would call him sir, right? But man, there was some times I had a hard time with my, with my brother. In fact, I could tell you, I don't have time for, to do it tonight. I could tell you story after story of the wisdom beyond his years that my brother displayed in dealing with me as a student when he was a new teacher. Just the things that he said to me and the way he said it to me, and I just couldn't argue with it. And I'm like, man, he's right. I didn't admit to him he was right. In fact, I would scratch this off the recording. Okay. Would it shock us if Aaron says, who are you talking to, Moses? Not only am I my brother, you're my younger brother. Let's, let's just quit playing right here. Let's just keep it real. My sons have died. Why don't you back off? Why don't you just step back a minute? And I think we would all think, I get it. But look how he says it. And Aaron said to Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. What such things? Oh, yeah, my two sons died. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? Think, think how long he had kept quiet. I love verse 20. And when Moses heard that, he was content. You think? I think Moses should have said, come here. And just had two brothers hug. Doesn't happen that we know of. But I'm just amazed that Aaron kept quiet that long and the respect that he showed. I want to give you four statements very quickly. I'm going to, laugh. I'm going to give you two statements, then four, and then three more. No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> First of all, this will help us. Good people can miss it. I mean, they can really miss it. Aaron's awfully, excuse me, Moses is an awfully good man. 
Now, praise the Lord, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and he never misses it. Good people can miss it. You know, if you think someone's a jerk and everybody else thinks they're great, is it possible you might be wrong? Is it possible you can give them another chance? But the way we typically feel is, if my interactions with that person haven't been great, I don't care if everybody else in the church loves him, I know the real jerk he is. Or, everybody hates that one guy, but he was kind to you, well, he's not so bad, right? We judge everybody based on how they treated us. How about we do this? How about we treat people how we would want everybody else to treat us? Give them the good, really good people can be really wrong. Sometimes they miss it. Maybe, maybe because of fear. I can understand why Moses is all business. He didn't want to face God's wrath. Maybe because of duty. They feel like we've got to do this. Maybe because of nerves. Sometimes when we don't know what to say, we just say anything. Right? See Peter in the Bible. <laughs> and uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, let's build the, the three, so three tabernacles. One for you, one for... Eli and the Bible says because he didn't know what to say. <laughs> if you don't know what to say, don't. Maybe because we all have bad days. Good people can miss it. And I guess what I'm saying is that's why they need grace. Grace is something that we don't deserve. Maybe we can give somebody something they don't deserve in a good way. Of, I've had people come to me many times and say, I, I talked to so-and-so. Listen how rude they were to me. And I'm glad my church members have proved me right many times. I've said to them, I said, you know, I know they walk with the Lord. Give the Lord a chance to use their walk with him in the next day or two to smack them upside the head and just see what happens. And I mean, many, many times the person has come back to the other person and said, I was out of line. I, I want you to forgive me. Man, what a great testimony. But what if you didn't give that person any grace? Well, I don't want to hear it. because you. you... Number two, no matter the situation, always make sure people know that they matter. Now, I will say this. They don't matter most. God's truth mattered most. We couldn't compromise God's truth. But that doesn't mean he couldn't let him know that he mattered. We don't have the freedom to compromise God's truth to get along with people. But I don't want people to hate me be because of my disposition. I can't change my position. I want even people I would disagree with to know I love them and God loves them more than they can ever possibly understand. But I want the people that I am with to know they matter. I don't mean that, well, the color of the, the pew in the church matters more than that. I'm not talking about that. People matter more than that. I mean, hey, I'm, you know what? I didn't invent it. God invented marriage, but I'm just going to go ahead and change the definition of it. No, I don't, we don't have that prerogative. But those who disagree with us about the definition of marriage should still know, you have no idea how much God loves you. In fact, that is one of the reasons why. We can't change the definition of marriage because he loves you. Never let people think they don't matter. John 8, the woman taken in the act of adultery, how gracious Jesus was. The woman who touched Jesus' garments as, garment as he walked through, and everybody said, what do you mean who touched you? And he, the grace that he showed to her. The healings that he did on the Sabbath, just when the other guys would get mad because he was caring about people. It's possible to be so focused that we forget what people are going through. Now the four statements about grace. First of all, grace considers what others are going through and helps us put ourselves in their place. You know, and, and by the way, I think that's kind of what we've done in this passage here tonight. How many times have I said, I wouldn't blame Aaron. I would get it. Why? Because I've tried to put myself in this passage and think, man, how would I feel if, I, if this happened to me? Or if Moses, man, Moses was pretty harsh. Well, yeah, he was in a tough spot, wasn't he? We're trying to put our... Grace will cause us to consider what other people are going through and put ourselves in their place. 
Second, grace should give us the discernment to know when somebody needs tough love or somebody needs a little bit of space. And may I say, there have been times I've been wrong about the tough love part. I need tough love. Well, I was a little stronger on the tough than I was on the love. Right? But there's, there's a time to parents, there's a time to, you can't fight every single battle. Or you got to give a little bit of margin. You know what? Some of the toughest battles I've ever fought in my life have been on my knees and gone to the Lord and say, God, you got to do something here. I can't. I'm not, I don't mean shirking my responsibility as a parent or as a pastor. I mean knowing, God, I've, I've run out of the opportunity to give them tough love. I need to give them I need to give them grace, but you got to keep working on them. Number three, grace should give us the discernment to know when someone may have a reason for acting ingraciously. Perhaps the most amazing thing in the chapter is how Aaron showed grace to Moses. Yeah, the respect he showed, but I'm amazed at how gracious Aaron was to Moses. Moses, don't forget what happened to me today. When he heard this, he was content. I think Aaron's grace to Moses helped Moses. Number four, grace should give us the discernment (laughs) to know when we're wrong, you'd think. And when Moses heard this, what does it say, that last verse? He was content. You know what, Aaron? I've said enough. I don't know if they hugged it out as brothers. But would it shock us if they did after a statement like that? What does it mean when he was content? He just stopped in the middle and he was good, walked away. No, I, when he heard it, he was content. Let me repeat what I said at the beginning. Sometimes we, Moses, are insensitive because we don't think about what the other Aaron has been through. And the second statement I said at the beginning, sometimes we, us, the casual observer of this passage, are insensitive. Can't believe Moses. Because others don't know what we've been through. We're the others. We've got to be careful, don't we? Well, how should we extend grace? Well, let me ask you this. How has God extended grace to you? He keeps letting you breathe on his earth. (laughs) I've I've let him down so many times. Nobody's ever wronged me more than I've wronged God. So it ought to be a reminder to us of, all right, freely you have received, freely give. Okay, this person needs a little bit of grace. Let me back off. And you know, you know how you gotta stay, you, you know how you stay in touch with that? You gotta stay close to the Lord. And and when you blow it, and every one of us will. It could happen tonight before you go home. Just wait. You don't, you don't want to get with my pet peeve. I'll start meddling about driving in traffic. <laughs> right? And the worst man, that's that was good stuff tonight about grace and you speed up because that guy's trying to get over. What are you doing? <laughs> oh man, I already blew it. Right? Or you let a person in, and then they don't wave. Or they don't, at least give me the nod. Oh. Oh. Right? Or how many have been there? You're just minding your own business. You're even thinking you're being gracious, and a per- you're letting a person in. They turn, they give you the finger as their turn. What was that for? What, what did I do? Right? This is some good, good preaching for us, from this, good truth from this chapter. And I think every one of us would see the need for it. But every one of us can blow it. So go back to the Lord and say, all right, Lord, (laughs) help. Every time you need grace from him for what you've done ought to be a reminder. Let me show that grace to other people. God's good to us, isn't he? Interesting story in Leviticus 10, isn't it? Something else. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us tonight. I don't think there'd be anybody here that doesn't understand why we need to be gracious to other people. 
But I also don't think there's anybody here tonight that hasn't needed to practice this in the last couple weeks, if not the last couple hours. I pray that you'd help us to let these truths take root, take hold. And I pray that you'd bless the remaining moments here tonight. You know, if the Lord's spoken to you, if there's somebody maybe he's put on your mind or a situation that he calls to mind where you've blown it, maybe we could use just a minute here to go to the Lord, make it right with him. It could be there's somebody here tonight when we're done, or even now if you want it. You got to go to him and you got to just say, well, I blew it. I need you to extend the grace to me that I didn't show to you. Let's keep short accounts with God. Let him have his way. Pastor.